Hello, I'm Sabina Shields Freeman. I'm from Fairview, Pennsylvania, and I'm here to tell you about Erie County women in wartime. The, uh, it's been said of women that they also serve who only stand and wait. But I'm happy to say that there were quite a few Erie County women who did much more than that. Um, the county actually formed in 1803. And so the first war to occur after that was um, the War of 1812. James Madison was the president and the war was from 1812 to 1814. Although there was a battle in January, 1815, and we were victorious with that. Uh, what this war did for us was uh, provide a sovereignty for our nation. We were um, related now to each other. Uh, this is a war that came to Erie's front, uh, war front, water front. By 1813, it wasn't going well for us. The western forts uh, were falling to the British and their Indian allies. There were uh, uh, atrocious things going on there, and the rumors were, were rampant that the Indians were going to be coming along the lakes and uh, killing everybody in their path. The war, uh, the fighting in Buffalo was not going well. There was a fear theory that uh, if we could just beat the British fleet on the lakes, that that would be a turning point. The trouble was we didn't have a fleet. So Erie was deemed the perfect place to make the fleet, to build the fleet. But what this did was it required almost every able-bodied man in the county to come forward and take part in some way. Farm wives found that their men were called into Erie and they had to take over their chores. Uh, other women who uh, were not living on farms were uh, frequently sent south for their own safety. Because so many people were coming into Erie, it became a war zone. It was uh, chaotic and there was fear everywhere. People were everywhere. Uh, as uh, the summer of 1813 progressed, Commodore Perry, who was going to be leading that fleet, required a flag. He approached Thomas Forster, who was a civic leader at the time, and asked if he knew any women still in the area who could make this flag for him. So Thomas Forster said, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. His two sisters were still here, Dorcas Forster Bell and Margaret Forster Stewart. They each had a couple of older daughters and uh, Thomas himself had an older daughter. So these two women and the five nieces got together in Margaret's house. They were steadfast in this project and they made the flag. Um, the uh, historic marker stands in the promenade behind the Maritime Museum and it tells the story of the bravery of these women and the flag they made don't give up the ship. Uh, it is now preserved in the Naval um, Museum uh, at Annapolis. So, the next war was the war with Mexico. Um, there was this theory that we wanted to have a manifest destiny. This was our destiny, to stretch across the continent, to be a country that was ocean to ocean. James Polk was the president, and the, the time for this war was 1846 to 1848. Uh, Polk went to uh, the uh, president of Mexico and uh, said, uh, how about selling us California, that we could, uh, then we could uh, complete our manifest destiny. Well, Mexico wasn't interested in selling. One way or another it led to war, and we won but we had to pay dearly in spite of winning for California. We turned it into three states, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. Now, according to the 1884 history by, uh, uh, with the editors Warner and Beer, uh, Erie County men did not really participate in this war. There were so few they could not even make up a unit, which is 65 people. So if there weren't any women and men, then there weren't any women either. The next war was the Civil War. 
Abraham Lincoln was elected president in November. Several southern states had vowed that if this happened, they would secede. So he was elected in November, and they began uh, seceding from the Union in December. After he was inaugurated, the first shot was fired. And um, by now, Erie County women had a better way to travel than on horseback through the wilderness. There were railroads through the north, and women were able to travel. One was Clara Harris Austin. Uh, her husband, who was an officer, had been injured. He was in a uh, hospital in Arlington, Virginia. So she traveled by train to get to him and provide nursing care for him. She may have known another Clara that was living in the area at the time. She did practically the same thing, only she organized a group called Relief for the Wounded. And uh, the women who volunteered for this went into the hospitals and provided care for the wounded men. Uh, <clears throat> she uh, continued working for the wounded, the fallen, finding their graves for their families after the war. And um, in 18, early 1880s, she uh, was in Europe and happened to see and hear about this organization, the Red Cross. Well, she came home and renamed her group from Relief for the Wounded to the American Red Cross. And of course, you know her name was Clara Barton. Um, <clears throat> here in Erie, um, uh, just as they had in World War II, women stepped forward on their farms to help with the men's chores. But there were other groups that organized national, nationally and that were um, uh, represented by chapters here in Erie. One was the Women's Relief Committee and also the Ladies Aid Society. Callista Ingersoll Guerra, who was a teacher and artist, uh, was president of the Erie chapter of the Ladies Aid Society. Another Erie member that has a well-known name here was Sarah Reed. They collected funds to buy linens and uh, whatever medicines that they could. Their group made surgical dressings and bandages, and they did what they could. They also provided money to uh, uh, for um, raise money for uh, buying food for the families of the poorer soldiers. Sarah Reed did something rather interesting. She took it on uh, as her special jobs. The American uh, Red Cross ladies were meeting the troop trains as they traveled to their new um, destinations and assignments and, and uh, giving them meals. But there were also trains going through with injured and wounded heading for hospitals. They lay on their pallets in their filthy uniforms. You could smell gangrene in, the, in these cars. And Sarah went on board and distributed handkerchiefs now that's an interesting thing, to give a wounded man a handkerchief. But she had a purpose. It became filters for the smells there, and they were also needed for the hospitals afterwards. Sounds like a pretty practical thing to do. After the war, a lot of the uh, northern communities were uh, raising monuments to the uh, veterans and the war dead. In fact, the very first one we know about that was uh, erected was in Girard here in Erie County <clears throat> by circus showman uh, Dan Rice. It was right in the middle of the main street, Route 20, as it went through Girard. Well, the men here in Erie were trying to figure out where a monument should go here. How about the middle of State Street? Well, where, uh, where, where else would it be? Should we tax people for this or should we raise donations? There was so much controversy that nothing happened. So three women took it on as a project. I did not specifically read that the men didn't like it, but the controversy continued. The ladies were called the Monument Layers ladies. They were Helen Ball, Carolyn Moorhead, and Sarah Reed. Their purpose then was to collect money, and they did it by donations. The uh, monument had a soldier and a sailor on. They were holding on to a flag. Their, the the uh, controversy continued, and so when it came time to finish it, 
uh, and put it in place, they decided they would just have it set in place and no dedication ceremony. This would just be one step too many. And so it was put on the east side of Perry Square, facing east. Well, in 1937, another woman, Annie Baxter, kind of got in, interested in this monument. She realized there were two veterans of the Civil War still living. And she thought it was surely time now to dedicate this, this monument. Um, Actually, it took her two years until November 11th, 1939, to have a, a dedication ceremony. By then, the two men were still living, but unable to attend. And so finally, uh, almost 100 years later, well, 50 years later, the dedication occurred. And now that same monument is standing on the west side, facing west. The next war was the War of 1812. This, by the way, is the monument. The war, uh, excuse me, the Spanish-American War, which took place in 1898. Actually, it was 112 days in 1898. William McKinley was the president, and uh, his Secretary of State was John Hay. John Hay called this a splendid little war. Uh, it was one that William McKinley didn't have a lot of uh, feeling for. It was uh, probably aroused by uh, citizens in Florida, you can see how close they are, hearing the story of the Cuban folks who were uh, occupied by uh, Spanish troops who were uh, mean to them, cruel, uh, creating uh, vicious attacks on individuals and so on. Two newspaper men got involved with it. They were William Randolph Hearst and jo Joseph Pulitzer. This, by the way, is where the term yellow journalism comes from. At any rate, William McKinley felt that there was enough uh, empathy in the country that he needed to do something. So he sent the SS Maine, a destroyer, to Havana and parked it there, moored it there in Havana Harbor. Uh, <clears throat> just to, to make a show of um, strength here. Well, on the early evening of February 15th, 19, 1898, the SS Maine blew up. Was it an act of war or was it some sort of an accident? Uh, the people kind of thought it was a war. This is the one where Teddy Roosevelt, you may recall, and his uh, Rough Riders became involved in it. At any rate, we won that war, and of course it cost us some money too. Uh, we gave Cuba their, their independence. <clears throat> we also, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me. We also um, won Puerto Rico, and in the Pacific, we won the Philippine Islands and Guam. At the same time, we were annexing the uh, Hawaiian Islands. So this created quite a uh, presence for us in the uh, Pacific. Um, we gave Cuba their independence. Puerto Rico became a commonwealth. Eventually, we gave the Philippines their independence as well, and the Hawaiian Islands became a state. So uh, what we know about this war is there were very few Erie County men who were involved. However, the American Red Cross was there. We have no information on how many um, Erie County women may have belonged to that group, but their performance there was exemplary. The next war then was the next um, century. In March 1917, President Woodrow Wilson asked Congress to declare war on the Axis. Europe had already been at war for three years, and uh, it appeared to be a stalemate. Well, uh, Woodrow Wilson had um, campaigned for his second term uh, based on the fact that he would not go to war. But in January of 1917, the Germans sabotaged <clears throat> with their submarines. They torpedoed five merchant uh, ships belonging to the United States. In February, 
a telegram was intercepted between uh, German officials and their ambassador to Mexico. Um, he was being asked to stir up the Mexicans and claim that if they would invade the United States and Germany won the war, Mexico would get California back. Well, this was just too much. And so in March, um, Woodrow Wilson asked for a declaration of war. This, this war came at a perfect time because women were now emerging. They wanted to prove that they could do more and be more. They were seeking equality. They had already joined such service organizations as uh, the YWCA and the Women's Club and so on, and they had also joined suffrage movements. So this war was, was just right for them at this point in time. President Wilson soon organized the Council of National Defense and asked Ida Tarbell uh, to be on the committee that would encompass women's activities. Uh, women were encouraged to uh, uh, ration food in their homes, that sort of thing. Women also joined the Ladies Auxiliary of the Army and Navy Union. This organization aided veterans as well as families of uh, deceased soldiers. It formed in 1841 and still continues to this day. Anna Lawson in 1918, who was an Erie woman, served as the national deputy for the auxiliary. And another Erie businesswoman, Emma Gertrude Lawrence, volunteered with this group as well as with the Red Cross. Women also supported the Red Cross with chapters all over the county. There was a chapter in every municipality. Schools had chapters, uh, churches had chapters, PTA had chapters. Uh, it, was, it was an opportunity for women to do something and still remain in their homes. There were so many women that the uh, Red Cross made divisions. So there was a division for fundraising. If that was your thing, you joined that group. If you liked to uh, knit, you could get into the knitting group and make uh, socks and hats and gloves, that sort of thing. If you wanted to make surgical bandages, that was another one. So <clears throat> all this was done, of course, on the home front. Um, years later, one local Red Cross official stated that these women tended to be super patriotic and they were sweetly innocent. Mrs. Morris Guth was in charge of the Erie Branch and she conducted two successful drives during the war. In Girard, civic leaders Charlotte Battles and her daughter, well, we'll get it. Okay, we did have that. There we go. Charlotte Battles and her daughter Elizabeth were part of the uh, Girard Red Cross. And they had among their duties seeing to it that the uh, kits that were made up for um, the basic training uh, campsites were delivered. And also they delivered packets to hospitals, which included linens and all sorts of things. The packets included sewing notions, a comb, a bar of soap, a mirror, a writing material, uh, even socks, all sorts of things that uh, a man would want to take to, uh, to um, basic training with him. Handkerchiefs also. Gerard's uh, Cosmopolite reported, Cosmopolite was a uh, newspaper there for many years, a, a weekly, uh, on November 15, 1918, that the Gerard chapter had received 15 French orphans to be placed temporarily with local families. Charlotte and Elizabeth took charge of their placement. They found 13 homes, and then they took in a brother and sister for themselves. Now again, this was only temporary. Fairview doubled their membership during, during the war. Uh, they canvassed house to house for clothing, which was sent to Europe for civilian relief. The goal was one and a quarter, one and a half tons from this district. The Red Cross also had a daily column in the Erie Dispatch. It was uh, one column wide and sometimes five or six inches long. <clears throat> On June 29th, 1918, it reported that the Northeast Branch had about doubled her full quota of surgical bandages already. 
Fun drives were held regularly, ice cream, socials, concerts, and just asking for money, just campaigns. On July 18, 1918, the Red Cross chapters all across the county met together in a day at Waldemere. This was also a fun drive, and everyone involved with this was a woman. And as I said, fun drives were held regularly. Uh, uh, they also held Liberty Bond drives. Now, this was not conducted by the Red Cross. It was a municipality thing. And on September 29th, 1918, which happened to be a Sunday, there was a Liberty Loan Parade. It was the, um, the longest, uh, largest parade that Erie has ever, ever seen, even to this day. There were 200,000 people marching. 7,000 of them were from the American Brake Shoe Company. There were um, municipalities represented. There were organizations represented. Um, this is the Campfire Girls youth groups uh, marched in this parade. Uh, all of the um, mayors from the municipalities around, including Meadville and Conneaut, Ohio, were standing on the steps of City Hall watching the parade go by. There was one exception, and that man was C.W. Lawrence, who was the mayor of Cory, and he was marching in the parade in front of the Cory band. It was a glorious day, it was warm, and it was, you can just imagine the, the surge of energy that came from all this. That parade must have lasted for hours. Oh, but by the end of the week, there were at least 250 cases of influenza, and it, it just shot up from there. We all know about the pandemic we're talking about today. Well, this is what happened here in Erie County. <clears throat> there was a gathering ban. Uh, in Cory, there were a thousand um, cases almost immediately, uh, many deaths, and uh, the gathering ban then helped. And so by the end of October and early September, uh, excuse me, early November, it seemed as though the peak was over and the ban was canceled. Then we learned that um, on the 11th hour of the 11th day, an armistice was to be signed. Well, you know what happened. People got out in the streets and they hugged and danced and kissed and hugged some more, and the flu came back. It took till the end of the war to, uh, to finally get ahead of it. During this time, uh, the hospitals had put out calls for help. They needed women to come in and act as nurses' aides. And one hospital said, it's as patriotic for a nurse to care for an influenza-stricken munition worker as it is to care for a soldier in France. Fortunately, we got beyond that. <clears throat> so, uh, women also helped with the crops during the war. Only now they were organized and they were called the farmerettes. They lived in barns, abandoned houses, and wherever they could find. They demanded eight-hour days and the same pay that men were getting who were farm workers. And they could do that because America was feeding the world. It was very important to bring those crops in. In June 1914, 16 women teachers and college students from Erie formed a unit to harvest fruit in Northeast. Mrs. George Cubison volunteered to serve as their chaperone. And women joined the women's reserves, which was associated with the Marines, but not regarded as an official military organization. They were primarily secretaries and uh, drivers, which would relieve men for uh, combat duty. Because of the incredible service that the American Red Cross had rendered during the uh, <clears throat> Spanish-American War, the government decided to organize the Army Nurse Corps in 1901 and the Navy Nurse Corps in 1908. So now, one of the duties of the Red Cross was to recruit nurses for these various nurse corps. One who was recruited was Margaret Bertha Catlish from Union City. She was sent to Camp Lee, Virginia to work with the hospital there then was reassigned to the Army Nurse Corps. 
Many of the army nurses were sent <clears throat> uh, overseas, as was Margaret. She described her time as serving in a field hospital near the front lines. She lived in a tent, ate mostly corn willy and hardtack. She and the other nurses followed the men as they fought their way across France and Germany. And several of her, the nurses in her area were killed in early November 1918 when their hospital was shelled. After the war, Margaret remained with the Army of Occupation in Germany and had the opportunity to dance with General Pershing uh, at a social event. Several nurses were there, and he was so pleased with their performance that he danced with every one of them. Two other nurses from Erie who joined and served were Nellie Mae Lawrence and Clara Justice. A New York Times war correspondent, Charles H. Grassley, praised all the nurses. He had seen them at work. He said, they have taken the unequaled opportunity to work in the noblest service it has ever been within the power of human beings to render. He urged other women to join them. In fact, so many nurses joined the war effort that the Erie County Red Cross held classes on hygiene and home nursing for women who could temporarily cover some of the duties of the fully accredited nurses. The county had been charged with supplying 700 nurses, which was about 8% of the national quota. Um, the industry was put to work as well. Um, uh, they uh, made war products, turning over their machinery to, from peacetime uh, efforts. One was Erie's General Electric. It began operation in um, Erie County in 1910 and now switched its assembly line to manufacturing war products. Women were needed to fill in the jobs left by men who were serving in the military, and GE put out a help on it for, ad, for uh, women workers in June of 1918. I think you will want to note, oops. Uh, well, I'm not getting it. Um, at the top, uh, you will see that this is female help female. They had a special um, column for women in the war, in the uh, newspapers. Many young American men were lost on the battlefield during this war, and relief groups organized to help their families. One was the Gold Star Mothers, which was a group of women whose husbands, sons, brothers went off to war and did not return. A women's peace movement began during this war called the International Congress of Women, also known as the Women's Peace Congress. It was led by Jane Addams, who was the head resident at Hull House in Chicago. Hull House was a social settlement for needy immigrant families. Uh, living there also was Adina Miller Rich from Mill Creek. She served as the director of the Girls Protective League which functioned to protect young girls living near military camps during the war. Interestingly, after the war, retired Rear Admiral Bradley A. Fisk issued this article that blamed that war on women. He wrote that the requirements of their sex seemed to be the bottom causes of war, and further, that women seeking to outlaw war imperiled national security. He added, with a few minor exceptions, men had brought into being virtually all the elements which constitute civilization. Women should leave it to men to preserve their civilization. You can imagine what sort of a reception that article produced. Well, the next war was war, World War II. It also began as a war in Europe, starting there in 1939. U.S. citizens wanted to remain neutral, and outwardly, President Franklin D. Roosevelt complied, but he still managed to give aid to Great Britain while keeping his eye on the Pacific region and the Japanese. The U.S. had disagreements with Japan over their aggressive treatment towards China. The Japanese attack on our Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii on December 7th, 1941, was a date that will live in infamy. 
It aroused the nation into action, making this another world war. Everything women did in World War I, they did in World War II, only more so. But now everyone was engaged in this war, whether they chose to be or not. For everyone was subject to rationing, to shortages, price controls, and daylight savings time. They received their news through nightly radio broadcasts and the president's occasional fireside chats. On the home front, families grew vegetable gardens called victory gardens. They grew these mostly in their backyards. They planted and ate about one third of the vegetables that they consumed in 1943. Women saved cooking fat to make into explosives and hung blackout curtains over windows to comply with the air raid drills. Working with civil defense, men and women walked the streets at night during the drills, making sure that no light shone through the windows to give away ground locations to bombers overhead. Mary Sargent, Sargent who had moved from Union City to New York City, worked as an air raid warden on those city streets. And plane spotters were trained to identify planes, and they were often women. Two in Fairview were Ruby Cobb and Esther Hetz. Very few military planes flew over Fairview, either American or uh, foreign, and Esther later said that the two ladies played a lot of cards. Women were trained in feeding people as part of the national defense effort. One of the newly developed recipes was war cake, which I have here. It was a flavorful, heavy cake with shortening, not butter, and no eggs. Not only certain foods, but shoes, tires, and gasoline were rationed. Again, the Red Cross came forward to do its part. More volunteers were needed for the many positions they offered. Blood drives became vital and began in 1941. Goals were set to earn pins, and despite the warning about waiting between donations, at least one Red Cross, one woman, Ida Shields, rushed to be the first to get a pin. She was woozy for weeks. An eerie woman who earned a gallon pin was Helen Brogan Nicely. In Albion, Ora Umberg uh, began her volunteer work with the Red Cross in 1932. And during World War II and Korea, she was responsible for the home service program, assisting the families of servicemen and veterans. She was also very involved with their successful blood drive. In Erie, Maud Carter Shannon was known as Mrs. Red Cross for her work with the organization. The draft was reinstated, and now so many men were going off to war that there were shortages in the workforce in many industries. President Roosevelt issued Executive Order Number 8802 that prohibited discrimination in hiring for military industrial jobs. <clears throat> Some women who responded had never worked before. Women workers at the various Erie plants also did something special. Each one donated a penny a week to purchase cigarettes to send to servicemen. Generally, women who worked in wartime production were called Rosie the Riveters. In August 1943, the local factories together issued a call for 700 more female workers to fill open jobs. They would be paid while they were being trained and no experience was necessary. The release stated, at the present time, hundreds of women are doing work in Erie factories. Women have proven themselves very efficient in shop work. As in World War I, General Electric set domestic manufacturing aside and turned its machines to making more products. One Erie woman who worked there as a coil winder was Elsie Curry Davison. She also was one of those women who did not leave her job after the war when she was invited to. In fact, she worked until she retired in 1968. <clears throat> General Electric had so many women employees that they hired a personnel manager for them. She was Lucy Ogden Norton, who was responsible for the well-being of about 4,000 women employed there at the time. 
Her most difficult responsibility, she said, was to go to a manager and tell him that one of his employees was pregnant. Lucy also served on the personnel committee of the Red Cross and on the board of the YWCA during the war. <clears throat> Another busy industrial plant was the Aero Supply Plant uh, Company in Cory. Uh, that plant claimed that it supplied parts, supplied parts for every Allied airplane in the sky during World War II. One of the women working there was Concietta Frazina. And now, for the first time, Rogers Brothers in Albion hired women for other than office work. They processed wiring harnesses for spare parts and were assigned to work in a separate building nicknamed the Wax Shack. Erie's business and professional women staffed a USO club lounge in Union Station, and in Union City, Venus Smiley organized a mom's club to write letters to the soldiers. The number of members of the Gold Star Mothers continued to grow through no desire of their own. Tragically, Mrs. Anna Adams of Erie received word in June 1945 that her third son had died in battle. He was 19. An organization similar to the Farmerettes of World War I organized with the name Women's Land Army. It's possible that a few Erie County women volunteered for this work, but a German prisoner of war camp near Northeast provided a great deal of farm help. Farm help. <clears throat> Military branches of the service opened opportunities for women and scheduled and included the Women's Army Corps, the Women's Army Air Corps, and the way women accepted for voluntary services. Those were the waves. Only the wax were sent overseas. Erie's Margaret Ann Jones joined the waves in 1944 and remained in the service until she retired in 1975. Although stationed in the United States, she flew as an orderly into other countries. She was stationed in Korea during that war. In August 1943, a group of waves from Erie made headlines when they finished their basic training and visited home before heading out to their various assignments. The Marine Corps Women's Reserve that had its beginnings in World War I also functioned during World War II. One of the requirements was that a woman be at least five feet, one inch tall. Mary Jane Bach was two inches short of that, but she had two brothers who were joining the Marines and the recruiter thought it would be just swell if he could say that three siblings were joining. She was warned, however, that if she couldn't keep up, she was out, out. Altering uniforms to fit was her big problem. She also didn't like close order drill and constant kitchen duty. Mary went to Washington DC for her two year stint after basic training, where she learned that everyone participated in parades for visiting dignitaries except for people who were less than five feet, four inches tall, but they had to stand along the sidelines and cheer. However, everyone turned out for General Stilwell's parade. And then there were the female pilots. Their job was to ferry planes to new locations, test repaired planes, tow targets, service flight instructors, and so on. Congress would not approve of their becoming regular military personnel. So many women pilots went to Canada to join their British Air Ferrying Command. When the US group finally formed, it was called the Women's Air Service Pilots, WASPs. Despite the huge number who volunteered, in the end, only 1,202 actually served. They logged in 60 million air miles and were trained to fly 78 types of planes. None traveled overseas. 38 died in this service, and one is still listed as missing. Here in the Erie area, by 1941, seven women had completed their flight training. Four were married, and three of them did not volunteer. Elizabeth Ann Eberhardt, who wrote an aviation column for the Dispatch Herald under the name Barbara Holly was the fourth wife. 
She went to work as a publicity director for the Red Cross when the war began. <clears throat> Two of the three unmarried women had been working as airplane mechanics before the war. They were Louise Skelton of Erie and Mary Kaler of Girard. Both went on to become flight instructors at Edinburgh State College, which is what it was called at the time. This was a government-funded program during the war. Mary had begun her flight instructions, and I will tell you that Mary is the dark-haired lady on the right. She, will, she began at 16 years of age, and she liked to say that she started these lessons shortly after Amelia Earhart was lost in the Pacific. When Amelia went down, I went up, she said. She was a member of the Civil Air Defense during the war, but still applied to the WASPs. She was told she was an inch too short. Marion Riley is the seventh aviatrix. She also wrote a regular aviation column, and it appeared in the Erie Times. She had the ability and the height to join the WASPs, but she seems to have vanished from view after the mid-1930s. We are still pursuing her story. Two women who put their careers on hold during the war were Gladys Baxter, a nurse in the Girard school system, who did her nursing with the Army. Marianne Popovich of Edinburgh, who had been a supervisor at St. Vincent's Maternity Hospital during the war, served as a nurse in a naval hospital in Philadelphia. So many teachers left their jobs to help in the war effort that a huge push developed to find substitute teachers throughout the county, and many were women. Some women began their lifetime career because of an opportunity offered by the war. In 1943, President Roosevelt signed the Nurses' Training Act that created the U.S. Cadet Nurse Corps. The government funded about 1,000 nursing schools in the United States, including Hammett, St. Vincent, and Edinburgh State College. When women, sometime male or female, signed up, he or she was committed for the duration of the war, plus six months. Get a lifetime education free, proclaimed the ads. The first class began the fall of 1943, and the last class began the fall of 1945. Once ready for duty, a nurse could be sent anywhere with the Army, Navy, or Air Force, overseas or at home. Two women who comply, uh, completed the cadet course and served with the Army Nurse Corps were Margaret Lashington, Lashinger Glover of Erie, who served in this country, and Anna Conklin Finney of Waterford, later of Corrie. Lois Anderson began her studies at Edinburgh and finished at Hammett Hospital, graduating in October 1946. Another Erie County nurse, Joanne Davis, completed her training before the war started, although she saw her, nurse, her niece join and complete the cadet program. Joanne volunteered and was sent to San Diego, where she was assigned to a hospital surgical department. From there, she went to Guam for the rest of the war. Facilities were very primitive, and malaria was a frequent complaint. We saw everything, she said, adding that only one her nurse was sent hard, uh, start stateside because she couldn't take it. The teams um, worked around the clock, even treating Japanese prisoners. While on Guam, they were treated equally with the same rules as the military men. Later, Joanne served in Korea, followed by sea duty on hospital ships. I saw the world, she said. Another local nurse was Desi Ford, who had just finished her training when Pearl Harbor was bombed. She was working in uh, Greensville, South Carolina, when she heard the news and dropped the bedpan she was carrying. Right then and there, my two classmates and I decided we wanted to go to the Army. She enlisted and served in North Korea and Italy. 65 years after her discharge, she was honored with three military medals and a service button for her work. Erie's first casualty in the women's military division of the war was Lieutenant Claire Riley. She was an army nurse serving in North Korea, excuse me, North Africa. She had volunteered in September 1941 and later, <clears throat> 
in March 1943, was assigned to a hospital in North Africa. She died of friendly fire by an overly anxious sentry on July 1, 1943. About 60,000 women served as nurses, and of them, about 500 died. 17 of those 500 were flight nurses. 16 died during enemy ground action, and the, the remainder died of other causes. After this war ended, Erie County welcomed many women from other countries as war brides. Operation War Bride began early in 1946, with 70,000 coming from Great Britain alone. One who came from Wales to the Wattsburg area was Nancy James. She farmed with her American husband, and when they gave up farming, they, tur they turned their old rambling farmhouse into a bed and breakfast, Wilderness Lodge. She was widely known for her hospitality. Also today, like their male counterparts, Erie County service women from World War II are dying at a fast rate. Just this year in January, Irene Gorski of Green Township, who had served as a WAC, passed away. She was 97. The Korean conflict under the Truman administration was waged from 1950 to 1953. It was an effort to resist communism, which was advancing into South Korea at that time. And as President Harry S. Truman said, if we don't put up a fight now, there's no telling what they'll do. Many veterans of World War II had joined the reserves, as did some of the women. Two women who returned to duty were Army nurse Joanne Davis and Navy wave Margaret Ann Jones. One woman who served for the first time was a WAC, Shirley Knight Nash from Lawrence Park. Another woman who served for the first time was Bobby Jean Hobus, who was from Edinburgh. She completed her nurses training shortly after the end of World War II and joined the Navy Nurse Corps in 1947. She was stationed in Korea and participated in the Korean airlift. She stayed in the service to make a career of it. <clears throat> the Vietnam War lasted 20 years from 1955 to 1975 it began with advisors and grew under several presidents, eventually becoming a shooting war when the North Vietnamese attacked USS Maddox in the Gulf of Tonkin in 1964. <clears throat> this resulted in a resolution enabling President Lyndon Johnson to lead the US into war. Congress repealed that resolution on June 24, 1970. The Paris Peace Accords were signed in 1973, but fighting continued until 1975 with the fall of Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam. This war was very unpopular with Americans. Veterans still have unhappy memories of the return home after tours of duty. Nevertheless, women volunteered for this war as well, mostly as nurses. At this point, only two Erie County women are known to have served in this war. One is Patricia Meckley of Erie, uh, who was a nurse, and the other is Bobby Jean Hovis, who began her Navy nurse career during the Korean conflict. When a call was put out for nurses to volunteer for Vietnam, she was the first Navy nurse to respond. She was stationed there in 1963 and 64 and later wrote a book about her experiences, Station Hospital Saigon, a Navy nurse in Vietnam. She retired with the rank of Lieutenant Commander. <clears throat> the role of women in the military has changed considerably since Vietnam. Women's military groups have all been absorbed into their male counterparts. Further, women now serve as jet fighter pilots. They serve on surface ships and since 2014, They've served on submarines. In each case, women have proven worthy and able. Also, since the end of the Vietnam War, the U.S. has been involved in several UN-sanctioned operations against countries in the Middle East. One against Iraq began in 2003 and ended in 2001. On another date that will live in infamy, September 11, 2001, 
Four planes took off from various airports along the eastern seaboard in the United States, fully fueled and with the aim of slamming into vital buildings to cause mayhem and death. A terrorist group called the Taliban claimed responsibility for these acts of war. They were being trained and sheltered in Afghanistan. One month later, on October 7, 2001, the United States, under President George W. Bush, invaded that country in a UN-sanctioned response called Operation Enduring Freedom. That war is our longest war. However, peace talks have begun. <clears throat> the most severely damaged location from those attacks was in Manhattan at the site of the Twin Towers, which was the hub of the financial district. It came to be known as Ground Zero. Laura Grappi was a regional director of emergency services for the Red Cross and had been working in Erie since 2000. She was soon sent to the site to help the survivors and the civilians who lived and worked nearby and were impacted by this disaster. With her at Ground Zero were Sally Height, Barbara Richardson, and Melissa Lawrence, all of Erie, all volunteers. And another volunteer was Monica Phil, who worked at the site of Flight 93 in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Laura Grappi worked at Ground Zero for five weeks. As workers and civilians there began to fall ill from the toxic fumes and dense particle-filled air, she became involved in creating legislation for them, which included medical, medical monitoring and treatment. Altogether, she was involved with enacting three bills to aid the 92,000 workers and downtown residents who became ill. Then she fell ill herself. Laura retired in 2011 and is back in Erie. Although retired, she remains involved as a volunteer. She's demonstrated in Washington with others to renew the legislation to aid the survivors and was a member of the group who proposed and saw to fruition the 9-11 Memorial that stands in front of Glasgow Library in Erie. Her health today is somewhat improved. By 2011, it was still against military policy to have women in ground combat. But that year, women were asked to volunteer to form a trial unit of combat-ready females. Many more volunteered than were needed. Those chosen trained at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and late that year were assigned to Afghanistan. Their success led to the ban being lifted in January 2016. Today, women also serve as Army Rangers. As of August 1st, 2019, women number about 14% of our ground troops. It's not known if any women from Erie County currently are serving in these advanced military positions. Also, we have no current data about Erie County women attending any of the military colleges, possibly intending to make this a career. In time, these numbers will become known. The seemingly endless Afghanistan war led to peace demonstrations that multiplied and became more intense. Many groups emerged across the nation to march and demonstrate. In Erie County, women gathered at Perry Square or on the courthouse steps to voice their objection to war. To summarize, as long as our military is somewhere fighting, Erie County women will be involved, either as soldiers, sailors, pilots, nurses, Red Cross aides, support groups, or in demonstrating for peace. And we will have Gold Star mothers, some of whom will be mothers of women. <clears throat> so the saying, they also serve who only stand and wait should instead be said of Erie County women, they also serve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for those uh, at home who are watching this live, um, it's uh, Fergie Ferrari, the president of the Jefferson, speaking from behind the camera. Uh, we are f we are following uh, strict rules here on um, keeping social distance. 
uh, but we want to provide these kind of uh, programming for you at home, especially during this time of difficulty. If you want to have a more interactive experience, uh, please join live as these uh, um, events will be announced earlier. Um, if uh, you want more information on this, you can find it on our website at jeserie.org. Um, so far, we have one question from okay. the audience, and it is as follows. How do you get interested in this topic? <laughs> it seems like a very interesting niche or niche <clears throat> or niche. <clears throat> Well, I like women. <laughs> uh, years and years ago, uh, another lady and I, along with the writers group from AAUW, put together a book called Erie History, The Women's Story. And uh, for some reason, I continued to collect obituaries and information about women ever after. Uh, there was talk of us putting together another book one day, and then uh, we didn't. <laughs> but I continued to collect. And it just seemed to me as though, uh, with this being the year of women, maybe something should be said about their contribution to any war effort we've ever had. Okay. Uh, you have a few thank yous, and thank you for providing uh, this uh, information uh, for our uh, community. And I will extend also that thank you on behalf of the Jefferson. Thank you for being us with us here today and we will be back at six o'clock for another presentation tonight on the COVID-19. Uh, representatives from LECOM will be here to tell us what's going on in Erie. Thanks everybody for joining us at home.